I want to share with you today something that um, actually um, a group of us uh, on Thursday nights have been gathering to do um, um, kind of an in-depth digging into Hebrews, but I thought also to actually share with you a little bit of a sermon on uh, taking what Hebrews is actually sharing with us and why that book is so important for us even today. And really to sum it up, I wanted to sort of talk about the steps that Jesus is taking to secure your and mine, our salvation. One of the important things is that, you know, it's like, you know, that the message that we have in Scripture is actually all about salvation, which is actually, first and foremost, a message that we need saving. If you think about it, there's no point to actually talking about salvation unless we actually have a reality of something that's happened to us that has taken something away that used to be there. And so in Christ, God is actually restoring that which has been robbed from us through various different things. But in terms of the fact that you and I are not whole, we are not, if you like, in the place where God desires us to be or has made us to be. We are in a place that even because of our world and the sin and the world around us and everything else, we are in a broken place. And so we actually connect with one another in our brokenness. And is it no wonder then that when we come to each other in our brokenness, that what gets communicated and what we see from others, what we receive from others, what we share from ourselves to others, actually all comes from a place of brokenness. Which means that we don't actually put our best foot forward. And during the week and everything else, the things that are said, the things that are done, we kind of like look back on that and think, oh my goodness me, what have I done again? And even Paul, the apostle, was talking about the things I want to do, the things I want to say, all of those kind of things. I actually don't do those. And the things I don't want to do, guess what? I do those. So what does it mean in terms of us now being in Christ and Christ having a hold on us that actually talks about the steps of salvation? Because this is one of the things that the salvation is actually a path and it is something really important for us because I fear in my own life and maybe yours but for the church as a whole that we often put barriers there where there are no barriers. Because one of the things is that God has actually removed the barriers. But we are the ones who then sort of say, this far and no further. And we kind of like settle on the little spot and we sort of think that's about it. And then we define Christianity, faith from that little spot. And we say, don't you go any further because come on back here because that's my comfortable spot. Because that's where I think it should stay. And God is always calling us into a relationship more and more and more. So there are two words that actually define everything we see from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. Two words. Relationship, that's what God has actually created us for, and separation that came in and brought the brokenness. And God is dealing with both of those. He's dealing with the separation, but the separation is not the big be-all and end-all. This is so often what we think, that the whole thing, the whole story is about sin. No, sin was the problem of what? No relationship. So he had to deal with sin to move that out because what he really wants is a relationship. And once you start to get that, you'll start to see what Scripture is talking about. And as we unpack that, and even from the old to the new, you start to see that God's plan, God's way of doing things is actually a step by step by step, closer and closer and closer, ever closer to the heart of God, ever closer into His glory, ever closer to where we were created to be and be at home. So, just go to the next slide, because I'd like to share with you then from Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 9 to 10, now you can see the words up there, that Christ does away with the first. That's the covenant law, the first thing that happened, in order to establish the second thing, the one by grace. And by his will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And that kind of like is a loaded sentence right there, because it's like, you know, you sort of think, oh, what does that mean? Well, 
we want to unpack that because that actually is kind of so key. First of all, there are two covenants or testaments. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what does the Old Testament talk about and what does the New Testament talk about? Because in your Bible, you will have the Bible that actually has both and they have both a very important meaning and they point to something very important. But what we have is that here in Hebrews, he says he's done away, he's finished, he's fulfilled that first one in order to establish the second one. And the first one could not fulfill that which the second one is now offering in Christ, that by grace. And he's done that through his will. His will, by his will, we have now been sanctified. Now I want to just pause there on that will. Because the thing is that if you go back to Old Testament, and we start off in Genesis, there was a very interesting scenario that painted God's relationship with us, being created in that relationship, and the garden, and the trees, and all that sort of kind of stuff that you know. And then it became a very interesting little battle of the wills. Don't eat from those trees. You're not ready for that yet. And the serpents kind of whispering, saying, you're going to miss out because God really is sort of like holding out. Why don't you just take your own thing and do it? You take charge. You exercise your will and then you'll be like God. You'll know what it's all about. First battle of the will. What was the temptation? Your will or my will? And we fell into doing my thing, my will. That caused the separation because God desired us to be in relationship with him. And it's interesting then that in the garden, the second garden, Garden of Gethsemane, there he prayed and he prayed something that connects to that event. Not my will, but your will be done. So there are two wills, if you like, and as it is interesting, we're going to play on words, my will and testimony, what I want, is an interesting thing about what God wants and what I want. And these two things are now in play. One of them is going to be your story. And God will honor it. Do you want God's will to be done for your life or will you want your will to be done for your life? And God will say, whatever you will. And the interesting thing is that when you then have a look at what we have in this, uh, this uh, covenant kind of stuff, go to the next slide, you have the old covenant, which was then based around what Moses was given, and the Levitical priesthood was established. And this Levitical priesthood going now from the garden and the issue of the will was the fact that we were broken in our relationship, and so God spoke to Moses and sort of said, I'm going to set things up again to make a new people a people for myself and a people who will then bring my word out to the nations. Well, that didn't go too well under that covenant because they established their, uh, their Levitical priesthood and did all of the things and then they added a lot more other things. And what we have is actually the birth of institutional church everywhere else is the same model. So what we can do, what we can set up, how we can do it so that it all looks good, we're going through the whole process of everything else, and it looks religious, it looks holy, it looks fantastic, so we must be all right with God. And there are a lot of people who have that kind of faith where it still is, what must I do? What can I do? The do theology. You know, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, and then I'll look good. Then I will be in the right relationship with God. Then I'll work myself into where God will give me the thumbs up and says, we're okay. But here, why was it that Jesus had to come? Because this first covenant could actually only point out something very important. Two things were given to Moses, and I'll get to the second one in a moment. The first one was the Ten Commandments. The second one was the Temple arrangement and that was what it was based on but the interesting thing is the law was given now what does the law do what does the law do to you how have you been going with the ten commandments this week (laughs) 
Well, so what does the law do? The law always accuses, the law always points out, the law always says, you didn't get there, did you? And that means that the wages of sin is death. So what the law actually only pointed out is that you'll never get there by yourself. You'll never get there by your doing stuff. You'll never get there, full stop. So the law could actually only bring about total depression and anxiety, and you see that even when, when people are in Jesus' ministry kind of stuff, well, who can then be saved? And he says, with man it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So he's changed everything from the Old Testament, which was a holding pattern and pointing towards a fulfillment when God was going to do something that he's pointing out to us when we work in our will, we can't do it. We have to do it not by our strength, by our will. We have to do it in what Christ has done, what God has provided. And so the important thing is that this new covenant was actually done only by one. And that is the word became flesh and dwelt among us, which we have in John, or the birth of you know, Christ in, in all the other um, uh, gospels, that God has actually come in the person of Jesus to fulfill that which we could not do, and he's become our high priest. And a high priest kind of role was that second part that I said about Moses because he went up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, but he was also given the blueprints on how to set up the temple. So he set up the tent, this tent of meeting. And in Exodus 33 verse 11, there's something amazing that is said about that because here God is actually speaking to Moses about why he set this whole thing up and it's all about as because God wants to speak to him as a friend would speak to a friend. What does that remind you of? Relationships again. What does the law remind us of? Separation. So God is actually always holding these two tent, uh, in tension. These two are our realities. But God has not given up on the relationship that he desires with you. So he has come as our high, great high priest to re-establish that which was broken. Now let me put it this way. In the Garden of Eden, we turned our back to God. And we started walking away from God. So the steps of salvation, first of all, means a turning back this way and walking back into a relationship with God. And God deals with every one of the broken things step by step by step. And when we sort of think, oh, I've only just sort of turned around and I've taken one step, that's only the first step. There's another one coming because he wants us to be closer to him and ever closer and ever closer. So when God has come, he went into the Holy of Holies, not made by man, but heaven itself. So those who are in Christ Jesus now have full access all the way into God's glory, into his presence. So that's one of the things that actually Hebrews is hammering on about. We now come before God with boldness. And so there's something really important that has changed. So just while we're talking about the two covenants, just go to the next slide. And I know that you're probably going to have to squint, um, but I'll, I'll give you those ones here in terms of looking at the two things, the Jesus priesthood and the Levitical priesthood. And just in terms of what Hebrews says, I'll just read it out to you. So from Jesus' side, it's only one. Only one priest who's done this. On the other side are many who have to do it again and again. The other one is eternal. The other one is temporal. Again and again and again. The other one is holy. That's Jesus' one. The other one was done by sinners. He offered sacrifices only for others. And the priest in the Levitical one had to offer a sacrifice for themselves again and again because they were also unholy. So he offered up himself. On the other side, he offered up, uh, they offered up animal sacrifices. And on Jesus' side again, he entered the greater and more perfect tent, the one in heaven. And on the other side, they have the tent made of stone, the one that's in this earthly place. And the last one point there, he entered by means of his own blood, whereas on the other side, it was always by the blood and means of goats and calves and sheep and doves and all sorts of other kind of things. 
It's interesting that when you go to the next slide, that this is the way that the temple was set out, that Moses got. And it's very interesting that when you go through this, you actually see the steps of God's salvation for you and for me. Now, interestingly, what does the temple actually mean? What is the code word in the Bible of what the temple actually means? What happened in the temple when Moses set it up? Two, two things. It's one other, the tent of meeting, God dwelling with us. Who remembers you know, some of the old um, Testament Sunday school lessons? They established the temple and it happened again when they built the temple. Something happened. They were in worship. God's glory showed up and filled the temple. That was the first one with the tent. They went through the wilderness. Then they entered into the promised land. After a while, David and around, can you remember, David sort of said, it's not good that he's in a tent and I've got his palace. I'll make a building. And so then we have that. Uh, we have all the, sorry, the destruction of that temple and the Babylonian captivity, everything else like that. And then Jesus shows up. And he speaks to them and says, destroy this temple and I will build it again in three days. I will raise it up again in three days. And they didn't get it because they were still talking about that natural thing that I was, was saying before. They were saying, hold on, my Le Le Levitical thing. It took them that long to build and you're going to do that in three days. And then it goes on, but he wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about his body. So now what are we talking about? So the temple is now in Christ. What is Christ? It is the full presence of God's glory. But now, kind of like, you know, within Him. Then Jesus dies, rises again, and He breathes on His disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And who are we now? The temple of the Holy Spirit. So you can see that when we're talking about what is the temple... The temple is about enjoying God's presence. The glory of God's presence. And that presence is with us. In us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when, the, when God gave us the blueprint and gave it to Moses and said, look, set it up like this. The first thing that you come is actually the door. So all of those kind of things were kind of like places of separation. First of all, there was a separation. We couldn't come into it. So God opened up the door. What did Jesus say about himself? That reminds you of that. I am the door. I am the gate. And the sheep come in by my door. Right? So we come into the door and the first thing that you then meet is a huge area where they had the um, uh, wood fire on the top and they would bring the Lamb of God onto that for their sin offering. When Jesus showed up and John the Baptist was baptizing and Jesus comes down the, you know, the road and what does he say? Behold, the Lamb. Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's actually identifying the very first thing that God has actually come to do. The first step is that he had to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin. Where did that happen? Happened on the cross. And interestingly, one thing that actually relates to this that is again we'll, you'll see it actually as we get later on what happened when Jesus then died that happened in the temple the curtain was torn from top to bottom again that which was separation is now opened up for new relationship before that it was you can't come any closer you can't come any closer you can't come any closer so behind that was the wash basin the wash basin was there for the priests to actually wash themselves clean before they could actually go into the temple. So the two things that we actually see here on the outer court is Christ's crucifixion and baptism. We are washed clean, we are cleansed, so that we can hang out there. After all, it's all done now, isn't it? What else is there? I mean, that's, that's, that's Christianity 101. It's like, you know, Jesus died for my sin. I'm washed clean. I'm baptized. Cool. 
Beach day. I'm in. What else is there? And I can tell you a lot of Christianity hangs out there. And God is saying, but hold on, I've actually done this to bring you into a closer relationship. Oh, no, 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 we don't want that. We're fine with you taking away our sin, and now we can do our own thing, and, you know, oh, we'll have a cup of coffee now and then, and I'll pop in church and say, it's like, you know, the roof's still up, yeah, it hasn't fallen down, so it must be okay. Sad Christianity, I would say, because it has only taken one step into what God wants to do. That outer court was open, open to the elements, just like our body is open, open to the, you know, the rain and the drought and the everything else that's around us here. So the first thing that God actually deals with is our bodily condition. He deals with the sin that is done in my body. He deals with my, my human being as a body and washes me clean. So he works on that first and foremost so that that part of the body that is actually dealing with me actually is also connected with something that's in me that you can't see. And I began by talking about that and we call that the soul, where my will is, where my emotions are, where you know, my mind and all the things that you know, make me who I am because this is only part of it. And God said, I've only actually started. Let's go and deal with the other stuff in your heart the things that make you who you are. So as we then, washed clean, come into this inner part of me, or in terms of the temple, what do you find in there? There are three very important things. You find the table with the bread. You find the candles, the seven candle holder, as, you know, in terms of menorah, as it's called. And you find a stand that has the incense that goes for, up to, to God and fills the temple. So what does that mean about what God is doing in the next step of bringing salvation to me? Bread. Just hang on to that thought for a moment. Has anyone ever baked your own bread? It's cool fun, isn't it? Especially when it comes out of the oven. It does not last long. When, when Penny does that and my kids are around, I mean, the thing is that bread is still warm by the time that the last crumb is taken. It's beautiful. It's nice. Um, but... We have that in our prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Have you ever thought to consider how many people are actually employed to give you your daily bread? From the farmers, the trucks, the retail, the whatever it is. You know, there's a whole line of people that have all been employed to actually bring you your daily bread. And daily bread requires effort. There's a lot of effort in making bread. So when we're talking about what is this bread when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, what we're talking about is the logos, the, the word that actually came into this world and became flesh among us. But that word is actually all the way from Adam when he was a lad all the way to you. We see that in God's word. It has history. It has work. It's been brought together through eons. Every one of us, when we read the Bible, we feed on the Word of God. That part we know. So that's substance. That's, that's you know, something to chew on. And it feeds us. But the other one, the light, is what's called sometimes the Rima word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. It is inspirational. You know when you read the Word of God and you're praying and you're saying, God, I really need you to clarify this so I don't get it. And suddenly you have thoughts that come to your mind about this and that. Or I'm preaching here and the Holy Spirit's working in your mind about other kind of things. And later on you say, I love what you said about this and this. And I said, oh, I haven't got it. I didn't say it. You can see it on the video. It was not, not. Because the Holy Spirit was speaking to you. He's just taking the words at that moment and speaking into your mind the very revelation, if you like, of what God needs for you to know right now. So we have that as the light that shines on us in our darkness, the light that shines the path for us. And then there was that prayer. That's another word. 
That's the prayer from our soul when we, when we speak to God and the, fills the, incense, uh, the, the incense fills the temple. So you can see that those three things are actually our internal way of relating to God. The first two were externally upon us. This is the stuff that now comes in what we call about worship. Isn't it? This is worship stuff. This is kind of in here kind of stuff where I'm saying, God, I want to know you. But guess what? God didn't say then, that's nice. Now you can rest here. Take one of these chairs and sit down. What's he saying to us? The curtain was torn. Come on in. Come closer. Now, when we come closer, you start to realize that that was the Holy of Holies. That is the place of God's holiness, His presence. Now, I'm just going to pause for a moment and take you back to the Garden of Eden that I said. When we turned our back to God, we were walking away from His holiness. Now God has actually set up a path for us to turn around and walk back into His holiness. Where do you think God wants us to be? Out there and saying, my sins are forgiven. Cool, leave it at that. I'm baptized, good, you know, done, dusted. God is desiring us to come back in the very place that He first of all created us to be. We are created to be in the image of God, in the very reflection of God. And I would even dare say, and don't shoot me down for it, but God has actually created us to be, like I said, don't shoot me down. But think about what God has actually done for you and for me, that He's actually created us to have a chat, walk in the garden, hang out, pick our brains on what we're thinking, for us to pick His brain on what He's thinking, what are we talking about here? Relationships? Of intimacy? It blows my mind, actually, when you start to just stay with that thought of who has God made you to be? He's made you to be the other person that He's talking to and walking with. It is amazing, actually, when you start to realize that God has not just created a little ant and says, look, you know, there you go, enjoy your life. He's actually made us for that relationship with Him. And where do we have that restored to us? When we come back into His holiness, when His Holy Spirit has been poured out to us. And it comes from there. Because that part there was totally cut off. So we have body, we have our soul, and we have our spirit. That actually, those three things that you see in the temple is actually who we are. And this is actually what Christ has done so that we may be back with Him. This is the steps, this is the pathway back into God's presence, into His holiness. Can I be assured that my sins are forgiven? Are you sure your sins are forgiven? When were your sins forgiven? On the cross. How long was that ago? 2,000 years ago. Are you forgiven? Yes. You are. Are you washed clean? Yes. Are, have you come and sought God out in His Word, in His, in His inspiration, His revelation, in His time of prayer, in your time of worship? Then there's only one more step to take. And that is actually in our time when we come before Him to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be restored again. That whole thing about what I started off by saying, that God is in the business of restoring you back to Himself. I find that amazing. Because when you go to the next slide, you can see there in Hebrews chapter 10, where it says from 1 to 5, and since the law was a shadow of the things to come, it was only for pointing. It's a shadow of the things, not the real thing. It cannot make perfect those who draw near. So the shadow of the thing, the Old Testament way of doing things, the law, oh, what can I do? What must I do? What I ought to I to do? It cannot make you perfect. It cannot bring you into that relationship. So it says, it cannot perfect those who draw near. So I can come before God and say, I've done all of this. I've done this for you and 
you know, that Matthew passage that I think is just so horrible in terms of that passage there. Go away, I don't know you. But, hold on, we did all of these things in your name. We, we drove out demons. We healed people. Oh, look at us. We, we've got credentials. God, you've got to let us in. Roll out the red carpet. Hey, what you doing? You don't know us. What does that tell you? What is on God's heart? The doing stuff? Or the heart stuff? Because the doing stuff has to come from the heart, not the doing stuff gets to the heart. So when we have our heart right, our place in the Holy of Holies right, we then walk out from there and bring those blessings out. That's where the doing then comes from a place of sufficiency, a place of God providing for us, a place of miracles, a place of abundance. And when we come and connect with that, everything else that we do has that wonderful way of blessing our home, the relationships that we have, the work that we do, Everything that we do actually has this presence of God coming with it. But if we don't do that, we are still doing the same thing as Adam and Eve did when he was a lad and said, I'll do it on my own. I'll do it for God, but it's on my terms. And God says, it's not going to work on your terms. It's no longer about your terms anymore. Because here's the interesting thing. When we're talking about a new covenant, a new testament, a will and testament, how does it get into effect? Has anyone had relatives? A will? How did you get your part of the will? I have to die. So, in the Old Testament, the death of animals is saying, couldn't do it. All this sort of stuff, just, just couldn't do it. Christ comes and says, I'll do it and I will die for you and I will make that heavenly covenant, the heavenly promises will now be ours. And that's why scripture says, now you are heirs with Christ, co-heirs with him. You are called the children of God. All of those words, those, the, the concepts, the promises are all about the fact that you are living now in a new covenant rela relationship with God that says that which he has promised is now yours. So we can enter into boldness and have this, and that is because it couldn't do that, that is why Christ has come. That's what it says, constantly Christ has come. So going a little bit further then, in Hebrews 10 verse 12, have a look at the next slide, it says, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time, how long? How? All time. Those who are being sanctified, that is being made holy, coming into the Holy of Holies, and the Holy Spirit bears witness of this. So the funny thing is, here you have Jesus who has completed all of that, those steps, and we come into God's holiness, and we receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit actually is the one who now gives witness to this new reality that we are in. So when we have these experiences, it should not surprise us. When we have miracles, it should not surprise us. Actual fact, that should be our normal. We should be going out expecting the witness, the Holy Spirit bearing witness to this new reality that I and you share as part of the body of Christ. And that is why we need to come and run with boldness again and again and again back into the throne room of God, that, that holy place, the holy of holies, to find our identity, our sufficiency, our provision of everything that we have, not trying to dig it in from, oh, I'm, I've got it in here somewhere, oh, let me find it. No, I'm nobody in front of you, and you're nobody actually in front of me. Without Christ, we might as well go home. This is just, again, going through the ritual and doing stuff for the sake of appearances. It has no content. And when Jesus actually then started to point that out to the Pharisees, he talked to them, you are like whitewashed tombstones, looking good on the outside, but actually just dead bones on the inside. And in the Holy of Holies is where God deals with those dead bones on our inside and raises us up. That vision was given already in the Old Testament. Can these dry bones live? Yes, they can. And guess what happened? He breathed on them 
the Holy Spirit came upon them and brought them all together. It was a vision about what the Holy Spirit will be doing in your life and in my life and bearing witness to the fact that God is about to bring you back into a relationship with Him. Not on your terms, but on His terms. And they are much better terms than you can ever think of. So we're coming back into the Garden of Eden moment, aren't we? Will I trust God with my life? Will I trust God with my future? Will I trust God full stop? Or will I go and do the same thing as Adam and Eve did and say, oh, well, look, you know, I know better. The funny thing is that if you go to the next slide, you see then that God has actually turned things around for us so much so, and he's brought that message so clear to us that if you can just read that with me, because I think that is so important, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way opened for us through the curtain, let us draw near with a true heart and in full assurance of faith. Nothing is preventing us anymore. Full assurance of faith. In boldness we can come before Him. Let us draw near with a heart fully seeking God, knowing that He can be found. As James says, draw near and I will draw near to you. It's like you know this coming back together again, this relationship that we have, not because I've done anything, but because Christ has done everything for you. And all He's saying, come on in. I've done it. Don't, don't make any barriers here for you. Don't s- stay there. Oh, come on a bit closer. Come on a bit closer. Come on a bit closer. So our Christian life, is actually about now, like a kid, seeking an ever closer relationship with God. And I know that we have in this world, as I started off, broken images. Because it's the Father who's actually our Heavenly Father who's saying, come on, kids, let's play. And I know that in this world we have so many broken images that sort of thinks about, is God like a father? Well, you know, I've got stories I can tell you about my father or whatever it is, you know, where it goes. So we're talking about in this broken world you still see only the shadow. But in Christ you see the fullness. So in Christ we have our Heavenly Father who is the fullness of everything that fathers are supposed to be. In this world, we have relationships with one another, families that are all broken. But in Christ, we have the fullness, the fulfillment of what that's supposed to be in our family that we have together. In this world, in the brokenness, we are jarred, clays, broken, shattered, down the bottom with pieces everywhere. But in Christ, you have been restored and made new. You are a beautiful vessel that God has now poured His Holy Spirit into. Let us pray. So gracious Heavenly Father, come with Your Holy Spirit afresh. Let us come into Your holiness, not just strolling, but running into Your presence. Coming before You to be filled so that as we go out, we be your presence to the world around us. We need your presence in our homes. We need your presence in our relationships, husband to wife and parents to kids. We need your relationship in our families where there's brokenness. We need your presence in our town, in our places of work, in our schools, in wherever we go. Your presence, Lord, may your presence come. May your kingdom come. Indeed, may we pray together the Lord's Prayer because this is the prayer that speaks of us coming into your presence and going out from here because your kingdom will come. So, our Father, pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, brought in the okay. your kingdom come, or will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, never and ever. Amen.